Hi, everyone. We're just letting everybody in. Uh, Carmel is my name. I'm the manager here at Lewin Gallery. Um, and we'll just wait a minute to let everybody in and then I'll say a few words, um, make the introductions and go through the format with you. So if you just bear with us and apologies, I know we were a minute or two late. Okay, so as people are being admitted, um, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. Beautiful sunny day in Athlone. I hope it, the sun is shining wherever you are. Um, and thank you for taking the time out. Um, I know we're all tempted when the sun is shining uh, not to be indoors or, or not to um, join in virtual conversations or events. So really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and absolutely thrilled uh, to be able to facilitate this conversation today, um, I suppose, in response uh, to this absolutely amazing exhibition that we have on show here at Lewin Gallery for the summer. Um, and thrilled uh, that almost all of the artists could join us um, and are participating in the talk. Uh, the exhibition, if you're not already familiar with it, is called Queer As You Are. And uh, the exhibiting artists, we have five artists exhibiting. Um, uh, artists Keen Bensil Bales, Stephen Doyle, Austin Hearn, Breetha Lynch, and Conor O'Grady. And the exhibition was curated by Aoife Power, who is also joining us today um, with me as an understudy. Um, and I'm also delighted to say that we have a very, very special guest with us today, Sean Kassan who needs no introduction, but just for those of you who are not familiar with Sean, he's curator of exhibitions at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. And uh, Sean is an amazing curator, um, amazing ambassador for the arts in Ireland. And I have to say, I'd just like to personally thank Sean uh, for his role in, um, I suppose, advising us uh, throughout this whole process in both, um, I suppose, the open call uh, for this exhibition and then join the selection process. Um, he's been a wonderful, um, I suppose, advisor to us and we really appreciated his time. Um, so thank you, Sean. So just a few words about the format. Uh, the format for today is we're going to spend roughly about an hour, 10, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we're going to give you an overview of the show and Aoife is going to do that. She has a presentation um, prepared. Um, she'll go through each of the artist's practice and their, uh, specifically the work that's on exhibition here in Lewin Gallery at the moment. Then we have a series of questions and the conversation is going to be facilitated and chaired by Sean. Um, and we will give uh, an opportunity for everybody at the end of the conversation and talk to come in if you have any questions yourselves, anything that you feel that Sean and Aoife haven't covered uh, with the artists. Today, uh, Stephen, Austin, Breda and Connor are going to participate in the conversation. And I believe that Keen might be joining in as well. Um, just with relation to each of the artists, because Aoife is going to go into their work so thoroughly. Um, I'm just going to say a word or two. First of all, I'd like to con congratulate each of you. Um, I think it's an amazing exhibition. Uh, the work speaks for itself and is a reflection of each of your individual practices. We've had an amazing response to the show. Uh, people are very engaged with the exhibition. Uh, some work speaks more to um, one audience member than another, but collectively 
the show, I think, has made a huge impact, um, both in terms of uh, the premise of the show, uh, the fact that the show is um, a new departure for Lewin Gallery. Um, it's really opened our doors to the community in the Midlands. Uh, people are very, very um, grateful that we've exhibited the show. Um, your work obviously uh, was very familiar to um, keen art followers in Ireland, but not everybody was familiar with each of the artists. So I think it's also been a platform to introduce you to a new audience. Um, and Athlone is um, obviously not a city. We would see it as an urban rural uh, municipal gallery. Um, that it's, it's at its early stages of development. And we certainly want to ensure that we were working with all sectors of the community both in Athlone and in the Midlands, both rural and urban. And I think Queer As You Are has certainly opened the door between us and new audiences. Um, and I think it's, it's particularly important um, that uh, the gallery um, uh, has an open door policy and uh, really, really uh, shows inclusive exhibitions and um, it's been just a wonderful experience engaging with all the audiences. Um, but to add to that, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure working with each of you as artists and individuals. And you've certainly enriched our programme for the better. But I think also on a personal level, it's, it's amazing to have made contact with each of you. And we've really appreciated the ongoing dialogue and conversation that we've had with you. And I'd like to thank you for that, for being so open um, and really being open to, um, I suppose, the work that we wanted to exhibit and also the conversation around the work and, and trusting your work with Aoife and myself. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand everybody over to Aoife Power. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Aoife, Aoife um, has worked as a curator in Ireland and particularly in the visual arts for many years, over 10 years at this stage. I've had the great pleasure of working with her as curator here in Lewin Gallery uh, for over almost two years. Um, and unfortunately, uh, COVID put a distance between us. Uh, but we had the opportunity to continue working closely um, throughout uh, the organization and creation of this exhibition. Um, Aoife is very committed and I think all the artists um, who were involved in Queer As You Are will attest to that. Uh, she really, really, uh, I suppose, gets, gets down um, uh, really hands on to work with um, each artist individually and uh, to empower them and to do everything in our manner uh, to uh, involve them in, in the curation of their work. Um, and thank you for that, Eva. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Carmel, for just a wonderful introduction. And I just wanna say uh, thank you so much to all the artists uh, for joining us today and a special thank you to Sean and to everyone else who's joined in for this panel discussion. Um, I won't, don't want to um, speak too much about the work um, in an abstract term. I just want to give a brief overview of the show and the artists themselves, just to kind of give a visual context to what we'll be discussing about. So um, if you just bear with me a moment, I'm going to share my screen as I have some exhibition installation shots. So. No, you might, uh, Carmel, let me know if this is. Yep. Okay, is that Perfect. showing in full screen? Perfect. Yep. Great. Um, so Queer As You Are brings together five artists who highlight the social, political and historical complexities of queer Ireland, but also the absences and silences that have resulted from censorship, limitations to documentation preservation, and the lack of space for sexual and gender differences. Um, all the works in the show are deeply personal and they almost scream and whisper of the people that are still on the margins of our new Ireland um, post-referendum. 
they utilize various methods of production, each touching upon queer subject matters that are still skirting around public consciousness because they're felt to be too taboo or inconsequential to address. Um, destabilizing the church, lesbian desire, the queer adolescent, hookup culture and queering the rural are just some of the themes that are present within these works. So as you, I'm not sure if all of you have visited Lumen Gallery, but um, as I move to the first slide, so we, as you enter into our new gallery, you're greeted by Stephen Doyle's work, which attending, is called Attending Kaloshta. Stephen Doyle is a Cork-based artist and a graduate of Crawford College of Art and Design. He currently has a studio in Blackwater in Cork. Um, he, they explore the issues of queer identity through the relationship between figuration and politics of representation. Attending Kaloshta is a manifestation of the artist's internal experience of the educational system in Ireland. As a queer person, the drawn figures conjured a perform experience of their youth and the adult they are. There is a duality to the perspective depending on the point of time the figures exist. The younger self is seen to struggle with their identity and identities becoming entirely dependent on a more hopeful future. The figures are depicted with a charcoal medium which gives the piece a stream rawness um, which shows that the artist is trying to depict some sort of trauma through a psychoanalytic adventure. As the rope transitions from the drawing of the physical space, it indicates the real presence of the ongoing mental strain the figures are enduring. And I'll just show you a close up of these work because they really are so beautifully detailed and drawn. Um, so with that, Stephen actually shares space with artist Keen Benson Bales. Now, unfortunately, Keen couldn't join us today, so I'll just briefly go through Keen's work. So sorry there now. So this is an installation that is shared in the space with Stephen Doyle. It's called Carbo Loading After Chemsex. Uh, Keen Benson Bales is an Irish artist residing in the west of Ireland. He is a graduate from IDAT. He has a multifaceted practice which explores rural Ireland, visual language and identity politics. For Keen, queer artworks are functional objects, not only as educational tools, but artifacts to con further contextualize and embody queer academia and relational queer art practices. Across this practice, his cultural interrelations have always been typified by methodologies that are feel queer, though the use of found materials and ready-made objects such as paper mache, wood, cardboard. All his works are almost fully recycled or recyclable. <laughs> um, they draw parallels between the aesthetics of rural and marginalized community. As Keane builds alternative narratives using figurations, motifs associated with reality, superstitions, and folklore. So, we will then move on to our River Gallery installation, which is shared by Breda Lynch and Austin Ahern. So as you can see here, we have mimicked the blue in Breda's cyanotypes and brought it forward onto our River Gallery wall. I'll just shift my notes on Breda. So Breda Lynch is an artist and curator and a full-time lecturer at the Fine Art Limerick School of Art and Design. Limerick, uh, Lynch has a Exhibited extensively in Ireland and abroad and curating exhibitions in Scotland, England, Iceland, Spain, uh, Turkey and Thailand. Lynch is represented in collections including IMA, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, the OPW, the NUIG collection and Limerick City Gallery collection. She engages with dialogues, discourses on queer feminism, the, the Western mystery tradition and um, occult culture, appropriation and the economy of language. Additionally, she engages with methodologies and approaches that respond to the history of mechanical reproduction. The exhibition presented um, in the images here is her most ongoing, the most recent installment of an ongoing project, project called Fragments of a Lost Civilization. The continuous issue of lesbian queerness and sexuality is still largely invisible, in part because it is seen to be not so significant in terms of le legal and religious terms. In somewhat a labor of love, Lynch endeavours to archive the hidden history of women's same-sex desire and make it comprehensible to a wider public. And I just want to show you um, a few more of the cyanotypes that are on display by Breda. Um, and as we lead into the, um, the library gallery, we have extracted one of this text from one of her cyanotypes, Satan was a lesbian, and we've blown it up quite large and put it on the back wall of the library gallery. And this will take us over to Austin Ahern, who shares the Library Gallery and the River Gallery of Breda as part of the exhibition. 
Austin is an Irish artist living in Dublin. He holds an MFA from NCAD and a BA Honours in Photography from Nottingham Trent University. Her and his exhibited, what, exhibited uh, excuse me, extensively in Ireland and his works are featured in the OPW collection. Hearn's practice is rooted in photography where he explores the possibility to produce installations, objects, videos, and performances that expand the limits of photography and indeed the medium. Prints, furnishings, wallpapers, garments, and the materials of painting and decorating industry all feature carrying his creative imagery weaved narratives which merge with fiction, creating worlds, characters, and scenarios that may not exist. His latest works, which are seen in our library gallery, is The Divine Divider, and for a race of portrait series. They are installations which address the hypocritical drag of the church juxtaposed by, juxtaposed by Hearn's raw self-portrait in which he reflects on his own bodily integrity and physicality. Despite holding um, a staunch position himself, Hearn's practice is nuanced in its reflection and suffering rather than in sacrilege. Uh, I, I liked her, uh, Hearn's quote that he refers to himself as the very bold child of God. I think that's the most accurate description of him we could give. Um, the infiltration of the religious institutions into the queer Irish life is, is represented through a scenario of domestic and interior items. His works are unapologetically camp. They remind us that the intermingling of sexuality and materiality of bodies, which the transcendent concepts of spiritual and, and religion can still shock us. Within this space as well, um, they share part of the works by Connor O'Grady. So I'll just move forward. Oh yes, I'd like to actually just dwell on Austin's images there. These are for his four racers. They are self-portraits um, printed onto wallpaper, I believe. Um, they're quite large and very impactful and they're almost um, oil painting-like in their quality. And here's the Divine Divider. This is a two-sided installation um, and this again is, I think, taken from photography printed onto wallpaper. Austin might correct me though on this later if I'm wrong. Yeah, oh, good, I got the thumbs up. <laughs> Great. Um, so now I'll just move over to Connor O'Grady's work. Um, so Connor is a multidisciplinary Irish artist. Um, he's currently based in Donegal and he has a socially engaged practice. Um, he studied in the fine art, the fine art and education in National College of Art and Design and fine art practice at Dublin Institute of Technology. Um, O'Grady's practice uses observation, documentation, and material visual investigation as primary techniques for creating work. He explores the research methods of relational aesthetics and the dialogue as a medium to examine the lived experience, experiences of marginalized communities in Ireland. His works are collaborative, translating his conversation with these groups into the moving image, site-specific um, interventions, and archival processes. Um, now, you'll have to forgive me, I was never good at Irish in school, and I'm going to make a very grave attempt to pronounce the Irish <laughs> um, titles of Connor's works, um, which again, he might correct me on later, so my apologies. Um, I can just hear my mother giving out to me now, somewhere for not picking it up. So, uh, Tabar Dum Dalof, Many Young Men of 20, um, Tomatopia and Lost Boy Says are some of the works that are included in this exhibition. Um, they map isolated spaces within uh, urban and rural settings as sites of promise and victimization. These beautiful, um, almost, I suppose, uh, I, I think they are derived from Russian Orthodox Church, but they're um, quite ornate and almost uh, religious and spiritual in their design are actually cigarette wrappers that have been collected at various cruising sites by Connor over a number of years. Um, they are gently folded and placed in these gorgeous patterns on the gallery wall and the gallery floor. Um, this is just one of Connor's interventions in the space. If you venture down into our bathroom, our male bathrooms within the gallery, Connor's also had an intervention in this space. Um, I believe these are the Lost Boy says. Uh, these are small uh, works that Connor places in a public space and um, that talks about, again, these, these kind of un, these unassuming spots as these safe havens for queer men that may not be out um, that may not be out to their families and friends and gets us to kind of really dwell on how much these spaces um, hold impact for those within our society still. So uh, I think now I've covered everybody um, and I'll be turning over to Sean uh, to lead his questions. But again, I just want to say thank you so much to all the artists for being part of the show. It's been an extremely educational experience for me and I, I think I've had one of the best laughs working on a show 
I've ever had like the, all of you are just wonderful characters and wonderful people and very exciting artists and even the work you've been doing throughout the process of planning this show has been absolutely spectacular and I feel we really do need to acknowledge Balna Art Centre's wonderful show which some of our artists are um, exhibited in. Uh, I, I'm, I feel that the timing of these shows are very very um, appropriate and I just want to say big congratulations to the curator and the artists that were involved in that. So um, I'll pass over to Sean there now and thank you so much. Thank you, Aoife. Um, we might actually keep the PowerPoint oh, yeah. on because we no can problem. we can uh, the artists could speak to their images then. Um, so thank you, Carmel, for the um, invitation to be involved um, in this in this project. Um, which it, the, uh, my timeline is gone, but it was more than two and a half years ago, possibly, when we started talking about this, and even longer since you did the open call. Um, so it was um, time has folded back on itself, but, but here we are, and it, it's great to see the exhibition. Um, I guess one of the the things the artists might agree with is that the extra time has given people, uh, the artists, a chance to really develop their proposals um, in terms of what we saw on the open call and what has actually been delivered. Um, I think it's fair to say it, it's really quite uh, evolved. And, and the works are more complex than might originally have been proposed. So maybe COVID has been good in some ways for, uh, for, for allowing that to happen. Um, and as Eva pointed out, that there has recently been a show, um, a queer exhibition in Balana. There's the show here at Lewin. We've just opened at IMA a, a big show called Queer Embodiment. Uh, the performance Francis Fay has a show on at March called Queering the Landscape. Um, so we, it really does seem to be a moment um, uh, in terms of the visibility of queer art and queer artists in Ireland. And we might reflect on, on that when we, when we come back uh, to think about our questions um, at the end, uh, why that might be, uh, why now, why the timing. Um, so uh, as Aoife has, uh, has given us in the introduction, uh, really one of the, the, the dominant themes uh, that, that all of the artists share um, is a concern with identity. Um, obviously, a, a queer identity uh, would, be, would be very, very apparent. But I guess in terms of trying to think how we might intersect various things, um, such as Irishness, citizenship, um, religious belief, for example, and faith, um, or, or, or other notions as, as, they, as they come through. Um, so we have, we have Stephen's slide up here. So I might actually kick off with you, Stephen, um, in terms of how your practice more broadly uh, deals with questions of identity, queer identity, youth, I think is a very strong theme in your work as well. Um, and I also know that you're very interested in, in things like uh, trans identity and so on. So could we kick off with you um, to sort of answer the question about how um, you think uh, you, you specifically articulate various identities in your work? And, and how you might think that uh, within this context, maybe there are things specific to Ireland or your experience that can be articulated. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I mean, um, my work does deal a lot with identity and um, I couldn't 100% tell you, I, I know what that, um, what that actually is, but I, I tell you kind of what shapes it. I mean, as you said, it's our, our backgrounds, our community, um, our likes and dislikes and, and so on and so on. And I think specifically for queer identity, a lot of that was never, uh, it's, it's something that we never really felt a part of um, because, you know, religion, you know, to put it mildly, hasn't been very accepting of us um you know our likes are you know not the same as the mainstream really um so i think when when discussing queer identity and queer in the visual arts um a sense of othering has to be present i think it's it's kind of an acknowledgement of um being pushed to the fringes you know we've developed our 
our own language, you know, our our own aesthetics, our own culture, our own sense of community. And, um, you know, for me uh, and, and in this work, I think you can kind of see for that, like, when somebody enters the space that they should know that um, the othering is a, is a signifier that um, it's the work is speaking directly to them. So could you maybe um, talk us through how you have deployed various signifiers in this work, this diptych that we can see here, and maybe the, the methods you used and how you came about the image making? Yeah, so, you know, um, as you were saying, you know, I was definitely one of those people who started with an idea for this work. And because of lockdown, it definitely changed because I kind of um, it was one of the only projects I was certain of uh, that was that was still on. Um, so I spent a lot of time kind of um, going over and over it. And um, I had this idea of it being a kind of diptych and it being a kind of used an adult thing but at the beginning it was only going to be one figure in each and I think you know I decided you know um that um it was going to be it had to be more than that because my you know my youth was more complex than most I think in that um as a, as a queer teenager I was kind of living two lives you know it was the happy pretense I'm all right face that I presented to the world and then there was the kind of queer self that I hid from everyone else so it was you know I was never truly myself as a kid so you know hence the second figure was added um and then I think you know the the second image is obvious in, in itself in that it's it's much more confident in it uh, the figure is you know walking in heels, wearing, you know, the lace top and everything. So I think, you know, there, there's a change within oneself once acceptance kind of comes into it. Um, and I think as, as another layer, there is this kind of duality to it. Um, I think that's quite present in a lot of queer lives and that we're, our development is kind of delayed. We kind of live our youth in you know sometimes 10 20 years past when everyone else has um so you know i think there is uh, those kind of factors in this that kind of signify the queer for me anyway thank you stephen um i'll pose a similar question to brida um because i'm conscious of the the gender balance on on the panel as well um, and uh, your concerns, I guess, your methodologies and the types of identities that you are articulating in your practice are quite different, Brida. Um, so Aoife, we might try and get Brida's work up if we could. Um, and you might talk us through um, the work that's okay. on show here. All right, I'll just run back around. I'm having technical issues. Frida. I'm here, I'm here. Great. <laughs> um, hello everybody. Um, I'm very delighted to be able to um, have a bit of an easy conversation today about uh, some of my work um, and obviously it, more particularly the work presented at the Lewin. Um, uh, obviously this, this image is unfortunately distorting things ever so slightly. There's a good bit more work on the wall. Um, these are essentially um, digital prints from cyanotypes and they would have been developed as, as uh, Aoife uh, correctly mentioned earlier over a, a protracted period of time 2016 up till now in fact it's still ongoing um, this kind of body of work that I kind of uh, refer to as fragments of a lost civilization you know so it's almost a kind of implied kind of a reference to histories and also a, an implied reference to um, fiction or storytelling as well for that matter um, the first one that you can see on, on the left 
you're probably wondering ESP in your pet, what on earth that has to do with kind of queer identity. Um, I, I, I don't have a cat, I might add, uh, but I am a cat lover. And um, uh, but but essentially, I suppose, you know, these images are what I would refer to as a very kind of collage approach, essentially. You know, I've been collecting images for years, foraging for them through different um, kind of platforms and so on and so forth. And, and of course, all the images here do make reference to um, uh, certain types of histories, um, references to uh, the occult or witches, um, uh, references to feminists, um, uh, somehow kind of described in very kind of notorious terms, almost like a kind of a handmaid's tale of feminists, so to speak. Um, and, and then, of course, there's, there's a very particular reference there to an old pulp fiction, which did exist as a pulp fiction called Satan Was a Lesbian, which, um, you know, I mean, you can't help but be kind of attracted to some of these um, narratives and dialogues in a very tongue in cheek way as well. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, some of these images, you know, very much arrived well before I did on this planet, so to speak. So, you know, it's, it's through kind of various, you know, kind of interests, you know, from a nostalgic point of view, um, the fact that they see like really kind of hyperbole kind of narratives that seem to kind of jar with with kind of narratives now or languages that we use now or, or and, and so on and so forth um i've also i suppose been very interested in this idea of what's referred to as detournment uh, which is a term very often used in relation to Situationist International. But of course, it's it's been used before that as well. Uh, my understanding is it was the suffragette movement, essentially, who kind of engaged in the first act of what we would refer to as detournment under this kind of um, uh, definition. And this was where their name was deliberately spelt in the media, almost to kind of... Uh, marginalize them you know or to, to kind of um, mock them uh, to a certain degree and um, and so essentially um, they just decided we'll own this if they mock us and they decide to kind of misspell or, or title suffragettes we will use this we will take this in a sense so I'm often kind of you know um, you know intrigued and, and enjoyed when I see very particular kind of acts of defiance done you know using a kind of detournment as, as, a, as a method in a sense and, and I do attempt to engage uh, uh, with this in, in terms of how I work. Um, There's also very much a dark humour happening in terms of uh, it's you, you take on quite very serious uh, themes uh, but you do so in a quite wry or even dark and assertive uh, way so they are funny but they're also quite disturbing as, as images um, and I think that's that, that that's quite an important uh, tool that, that you also use. Yeah, I, like thank, thank you, Sean. I will take that. I, I enjoyed <laughs> that bit of feedback there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. I mean, sometimes uh, you know, like I, I engage in a lot of appropriation in my practice, and that can be quite a tricky thing to work with sometimes, especially when you find an amazingly good image and like, what what can you do with this image? It's already saying everything, you know. And sometimes you know. It, it takes a while to kind of work with uh, appropriated images in that way and to, to kind of find a way of using it in a sense. And sometimes the most direct way is sometimes the best way to use these images in a sense, uh, because they're already kind of invested with a lot of power, you know, and various associations, you know, be they cultural, historical or, or whatever. Yes. So definitely, um, Brida, you use really, really interesting methods in terms of uh, using these found images which you then translate into different forms and mediums. And, and that's something that's, that's definitely true of this uh, show more broadly, um, that there's a, a very, very broad um, range of technique, media and method being deployed um, by the artists in different ways. So um, I might turn to Connor first. Um, and see if you would uh, talk us through uh, your work, because it, it's, it's sculptural initially, um, sculptural, quite decorative, but the methods you use are definitely queer, um, and the, the actual materials themselves are. Um, so you've definitely em embodied uh, queerness in the actual work, the method and the material. So could you, could you talk us through your process um, and uh, what these are and what, what they mean in, in, in themselves. Yeah, so um, the work actually began in 2014 when I had um, contacted a number of men 
who had been questioned by the police after a murder of a gay man in Dublin in the 1980s. And I basically retraced some of these men and started to talk to them about their lives using the processes and the sort of practical techniques that are available in socially engaged practice to draw out, you know, information about public space and spaces that they used in order to be intimate with each other, but also areas where they, you know, there was a lot of risk involved. And they started to tell me about the areas that they went to. They're generally public areas, parks and things like this, or alleyways, you know. And what I would do is I would go and visit these areas um, sort of by myself, usually, uh, I guess, in, in this kind of uh, strange situation. And I was looking for a material that I could uh, link all of the areas, you know, uh, that I could link them together. And of course, I could have picked up um, lots of different material because a lot of material is left behind once, I guess, uh, a sexual act or something happens. But the one material that I found was cigarette packets. And I had this kind of idea of people having like nervously smoking cigarettes before they sort of re removed the part of their psychology that allowed them to go into those areas. And that's the kind of thing that I wanted to focus on because a lot of the time, the men that I spoke to, they were talking to me about um, feelings of being disposed of or being throw away, you know, throw away a bull, if that's even a word, or being left behind. So what I wanted to do was find the material that spoke to, um, because I guess as well, that material speaks to a wide uh, subsection of society. It's not just gay people. So it was kind of a key to kind of code and decode what I was hearing, because the one thing about the uh, dialogical part of that practice was that I couldn't actually um, reveal anything about the men that had spoken to me. I couldn't give you their name. I couldn't give you, you know, personal information. So I had to find a way to decode that experience very, very, not simply, but very, very um, easily for the for the viewer to see. Great, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the 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 actual form that you've articulated here, could you tell us about that? It's highly decorative, but you've borrowed it from another source. Yeah. So the actual the singular form of the triangle is taken directly from the fact that in Ger Nazi Germany they would have used the pink triangle as a signifier for gay people, queer people. So I was using that material and or that symbol and then I wanted to find sort of ways of expanding that literally expanding that but it's more of a map of those areas it's kind of a bit of a coded map of the areas where the men meet but also I was looking at the time at the fact that um, Ireland and Russia had decriminalized uh, homosexuality in the same year but they had gone in two different ways I suppose you could say that they're very similar countries in many ways and similar cultures but it's just it was really interesting to me that Russia went in a particular um um, direction and Ireland went in a more progressive direction. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and so a similar question to Austin, um, because again, your practice, I think, uh, the, the screens and the photo so photographs self-portrait, the screens, um, not, not necessarily familiar uh, as, uh, well, the foot photography maybe, but the screen certainly is definitely a departure. Um, so could you talk to us about uh, your methods as well? Uh, your media, uh, your techniques, and and how you've articulated queer themes within that. Okay, um, yeah, I suppose, like I studied my degree in photography um, in like the late 90s when it was very analog, and then, you know, very messy kind of time, very like chemical, dark room, all that kind of thing. And then after that in the noughties and in the last 20 years, photography has gone very, um, digital and dry. So basically you would take a photograph and print it out and there's this disengagement from the actual process. Um, and it's, a, yeah, and it's a, I felt very divorced from it over the last 20 years from the, the actual initial analog age of photography. So I search out ways to kind of make photography that is messy and is dirty and is open to mistakes so um parallel to all that i have a background in painting and decorating so this work here and where i've arrived now in my practice is uh, very much a melding of photography and painting and decorating so yeah multimedia in a way so i make things that involve me getting kind of stuck in and getting kind of you know bringing materials in that are um maybe not controllable you know and maybe are open to mistakes and um 
bringing some kind of magic back in that you would have got in a dark room, say, for instance. So uh, this work here on the screen uh, is called Divine Divider, and um, it's quite a large work. And I suppose before I go any further, what I really, really like to do in my uh, photography and in my practice is to, well, especially with photography, to bring it out of the frame and like not just have a print behind glass or a frame behind it. So looking at ways that it can be a bit, the images can be a bit more raw and kind of more open to the world. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's something I've been really, you know, endeavoring to do over the last number of years. So with Divine Divider here in front of us, um, these are plywood panels. There's 10 of them. Um, they're painted, so there's a bit of a process to bring them up to kind of speed in a way. And then they are digital photographs, photographed in studio. The floor and the background are painted. So I kind of like involve this or kind of create this scenario in the studio and paint backgrounds, uh, bring in props, um, self-portrait like it's myself in the actual uh, images there on the figure um so the drawn, photographs are drawn from uh, religious spaces ecclesiastical mm -hmm. imagery yeah absolutely yeah like the um the shrouded figure here comes from churches it's called it's a it's a practice called passion tide in the catholic church and it's in the run-up to easter time where especially around ireland um the figures are, are shrouded in purple material. And I kind of first came across this a few years ago, just as I was kind of like traveling around churches, <laughs> photographing and found it really weird and really unsettling and just beguiling. It really just drew, drew me in, you know, and it reminds me of the, the, the moving statues in the eighties, because you would see, come across these shrouded figures in a church and the air would be blowing the kind of the fabric. And so very uncanny and um, unsettling and beautiful and just, yeah, so many things. So I, I went about kind of document this, uh, documenting this practice over the years. <laughs> but in this um, screen here, it's recreating that um, in the studio and making a bit of a kind of story out of that. And I see these figures as being sort of representing sexual repression in a way and because the shroud is the shrouded figure you know on the run-up to easter the idea is that the congregation don't get the kind of get to get the kind of glory out of the actual um statu statutory statuary okay. and so they cover it up so i kind of see that as kind of being yeah, great so um in terms of uh, we've we've you've touched there on uh, the, the the idea of church and state, and I know that's something which uh, comes across strongly in readers' practice as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm also kind of watching time, um, so we might uh, skip on to a question uh, to the four artists really, and this maybe we'll try and do this in a more conversational way, um, which is how you see. Um, your practice specifically or, and, and, and queer art more broadly as, as continuing to have a political significance um, and also an, maybe even an activist significance. Um, there's a, there's a, a kind of supposition, I guess, in Irish culture that post marriage equality of 2015 and even post the repealing of the eighth more recently, uh, that all of our problems are gone and uh, queer people don't have any problems. You can get married and, and, and stay quiet. So could you potentially talk to us about how you feel your work is situated in 2021 going into 2022 and what continue, continuing political legacies it might be dealing with? I might start with um, Stephen. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're right. I think, you know, there there is that sense out there that it's all kind of over and done with. But even if that was the case, we still have quite a lot of um, quite a lot of trauma to unpack and quite a lot of conversations to discuss about those experiences. And I think they're as relevant as anything else to, to document within our, our cultural spaces. Um, you know, I think queer art is 
is still political because being queer is still political. Um, you know, you don't have to look far to kind of see that um, even places that um, have established quite a lot of rights are being kind of taken away. I mean, look at Poland, for example. Um, you know, we are kind of standing on the shoulders of activists who um, who have kind of campaigned for years, you know, the, the Tony Walsh's, the Grony Healy's, you know, and so on. And it's, um, it's kind of, it's important to me to have these shows because if, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you know, would this show have even made it to the discussion table of, you know, in any gallery in Ireland of, um, will we even consider this? And I don't think it would. I mean, I think it's important that we kind of continue this discussion in an open, um, in open spaces like this, um, because if we don't, things could very easily be taken away from us again. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think, a very fa fair point, is that rights can be eroded uh, just as easily as they can be given. Um, and maybe Connor, you might, uh, you might take up the question now, similarly, in terms of how you might see this. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the men that I was working with specifically, they were they were left behind in the discussion in 2015. Their sort of lived experience wasn't really uh, examined in the debates or even in the conversations that were being had, you know, person to person. And maybe it's worth kind of defining that because I think you're dealing with yeah, very specific men, yeah. men who have sex with men yeah. who identify neither as gay nor queer. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. Yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily have voiced the fact that they were gay or that yes. they had those feelings, and, and they um, traditionally would live heterosexual lives, I suppose. Yes. And, and sort of to your question about where we are in twenty one twenty two, what I'm looking at and what was revealed to me uh, most commonly through through speaking to these particular men was their experiences with the GAA. So they, there's a, a legacy there with the GAA that uh, hasn't really ever been touched on, but. Almost, I would say, 90% of the people I spoke to had coercive and damaging sexual experiences when they were young in the GAA. And that's something that I really think needs to be exposed a little bit more, talked about a little bit more, um, because they get off quite lightly as an institution, an Irish institution, uh, where other institutions may not necessarily uh, get off. And uh, I'm really looking at reclaiming those spaces for gay people. So in some uh, art activity using an, art, an artistic action to reclaim those spaces that's what I'm looking at in my current practice I suppose and going forward. Mm. And Austin? Um, yeah well I suppose my work will deals with the Catholic Church and their influence over um, queer people, queer bodies and you know all that kind of thing but and I think they've got away very lightly and I think I'm commenting on that and that you know makes me feel powerful as a gay person to comment on that. Um, I think we've a long way to go. And I think, yeah, this show is really good. It's, 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 we're all commenting. It's, you know, for a young queer person to come in and see this show, I think it's really valuable for them to see that there is representation there for them. Um, like I grew up in the 90s and, you know, the Catholic Church were really, you know, still very active about, you know, and very against gay people and the AIDS crisis hit at the same time. And, um, you know, we were silenced back then and, you know, we they wanted us to hide and they wanted us to... Um, emigrate. <laughs> Pardon? They wanted us to emigrate. <laughs> they want, yes, they wanted us out of the way. Um so yeah. Great. And Brida? Um, well, I'm still very angry and Good. I'm going to be <laughs> angry to be perfectly honest and just being very direct and, uh, and uh, upfront about things. Um, I'm 51 years of age. Whoop, I've survived this length of time. Um, I've just gone through my menopause and, and I'm still very angry. Um, uh, I mean, essentially, 
you know, growing up in the 70s into the 80s, there was plenty to be quite shocked about, um, plenty to feel marginalized about if one was even admitting to oneself, you know, who I actually was, you know. Um, you know, it takes a while just to kind of have that conversation in the mirror, as they say, you know. Um, and, and again, I think anger is very important, you know, and, and I think it's very good to be able to kind of embrace one's anger and to be able to talk about it um, and to present it and for it to be understood um, uh, by people as well. For example, you know, I rail against the idea of people telling me, oh, you're, you're upset, Breed. And I said, I'm not upset, I'm angry, you know, so there's a very clear distinction there. Um, and certainly, as far as I'm concerned, plenty of angry women have made a difference in this world along with plenty of angry queers generally, so to speak. Um, and, and I get very angry still. I work in an institution. Um, I'm aware of all the things that institutions are still not doing, um, just because, yes, we had two referendums, again, foisted on, on minority bodies in a sense as well, where other people got to vote on my rights on two occasions, you know, not just marriage equality, but obviously repeal the eighth. Um, and, you know, sometimes people really don't kind of think about that, that very kind of privilege um, that some people had in that situation. And as far as I'm concerned, there's still a hell of a lot of work to be done. Um, certainly within institutions, again, you know, I would be kind of very much queer emancipation, not rainbow capitalism. I find it very irksome when I see a lot of institutions using the, the rainbow flag as their branding opportunity opportunity and it rings quite hollow you know I, I would have had one such experience this summer going into the art school to get a bit of printing done and seeing the rainbow flag outside and then kind of having to tear off anti-trans um, misinformation off the toilets that somehow kind of found its way up there in the middle of the summer and also yet again seeing visible traces of bullying within the institution uh, against individuals you know like myself, for example. Okay. So, as, so, as far as I'm concerned, sorry, Sean, I, I, I won't spend long. As far as I'm concerned, there's a lot yet to be done um, uh, yeah. because a lot has not yet been addressed in relation to this ongoing marginalization and historical e exclusion. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the church really needs to get out of schools and institutions. Yes, absolutely. So, I want to try and uh, open up the conversation to the audience who are here. So, if people want to use the panned up function or even want to to uh, drop something into the chat. Um, uh, now's, your, now's your moment. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Dorji, Celine, Luke, Ian, Susan. Any, any questions or observations? Any comments for the um, for the artists? No, everyone's very shy. That's not um, that's not normal among among the queers. They usually have plenty to say. I actually, I, I'll start with a question because Please, I, so. I think it's quite interesting having um, just listen to Brida and Hapash talk about, and then to this talk about Connor about his practice. I think both of you are almost dealing with two very difficult issues here. Like we have our new wave of feminism. You know, like you said, like I think there has been almost a very superficial. Um, like a lot, a lot of marketing, a lot of big companies have taken up uh, this feminist stance, but at the very surface level feminism, like really at the end of the day, what is actually happening? Um, but Connor, I know we were talking about how you actually felt that what was happening at some point was with all this, um, this kind of hype and marketing around queer issues, um, that it was actually these marginalized men, men that were still in marriages um, that weren't that weren't out that really couldn't speak open and publicly about the way they were feeling that you actually said that there was um, an older generation of queer gay men that were being marginalized and isolated and how does that um, I suppose if I'm trying to put the question simpler how do you address a very sensitive subject of pulling attention back to male issues when we have such a community now and a, a, a fight trying to establish establish female um equality essentially if that makes sense yeah that makes it makes perfect sense one of the things um i'm currently studying an ma at, this, at the minute and we had a visiting lecturer and one of her um ideas was that motherhood was a form of queerness <clears throat> which really kind of shook me a little bit because it wasn't something i'd ever thought about you know but it is i suppose you know if that's what you want to but then it made me think well where does that actually leave gay men or especially the men i was talking about like if we can include everything 
into uh, the queer umbrella? Where does that leave those men? And I suppose they're kind of the easiest one, the, the easiest um, category to remove in order to allow everybody in, which I think is kind of interesting as well. I'm looking a lot at the removal of the gay male from representation, from, from society. And I think, you know, maybe we should um, have, it, it's difficult to have a conversation when everybody isn't at the table. And I already feel a little bit like, even within this exhibition that I'm not really, I wouldn't identify as queer necessarily. So that kind of is an interesting thing, uh, thing for me. It was an interesting thing for me when the title of the exhibition came out. So they're kind of things that I'm thinking about at the minute, but in answer to your question, I don't know really. I mean, my technique is to use their experience and their voice and make that be the forefront of whatever I do. So uh, um, a lot of the work in the exhibition would be personal to the, to the artist, whereas mine is a little bit, I'm removing myself, but um, channeling it through my own lens, if that makes sense. It's the only way I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. But, but that's very interesting what you're saying, Connor, because we are in the phase now of being post queer already yeah. uh, in terms of in terms of queer theory, um, because queer is already uh, has died, apparently, as, as it yeah. uh, it's, its usefulness has been uh, abandoned. Uh, we're told what does it that, mean? Uh, yeah. yeah what does well, it mean? because queer was so, um, so involved in, in uh, identifiers and signifiers. Uh, and and opening up categories, but the difficulty was that every time you make a category, you put someone into it. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's very true. And so people like Susan Stryker, who would be you know one of the main trans theorists, um, says that we need to free ourselves from all of these labels and 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 kind of just be. Um, and in a way, your your work almost argues for that. Uh, in, in, in as much as you're talking about these these men particularly, uh, because of course we're also dealing with the patriarchy as a, as a as a question, and so going back into talking about the issues of these men who uh, I guess are, are identify so strongly with the patriarchy in a very traditional form, uh, you're raising really interesting problems um, as as to as to uh, um, queerness, I suppose. Brida, do you want to talk about that idea in terms of, yeah. of well, female I, I, identity? Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember in the 1990s, post-feminism was being used an awful lot, you know what I mean? But that didn't last long, did it? Because obviously feminism is still very um, valid for a whole pile of reasons, you know, both in this country and, and elsewhere. And of course, you know, you know, there's obviously different forms of feminisms as well for that that matter you know intersectional is pretty much what I subscribe to I wouldn't necessarily be kind of um the more kind of neoliberal form of feminism you know for the one percent so to speak you know so again I suppose it's kind of recognizing the kind of political kind of positionings um you know you know within you know certain terms as well you know um queer is actually a word that I do um identify with strongly to be honest um, I think maybe because of my first embrace of it would have been in the very early 90s when I was involved in my first um, uh, Pride events, essentially, and I wasn't fully out at that point, but I was certainly shouting uh, very loudly, we're here, we're queer, get used to it, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I sometimes struggle a, a little bit um, with the kind of current presentation of pride being so you know kind of wrapped up in advertising and branding in a sense that's why I, I still tend to kind of you know kind of, I'm drawn towards the more kind of you know the, the left wing of it so to speak or the couple of you know angry lesbians shouting you know from a pulpit you know um, whilst there's lots of whistles and bells going off further down the road you know so um uh, you know, so because sometimes I've stopped myself, I suppose, in, in the more contemporary uh, version of Pride these days from saying we're here, we're queer, get used to it, because it seems so angry, you know, compared to this more kind of um, soft form of Pride, in a sense, as I call it, you know. Well, Susan Butner has, has, has jumped into the chat to say, I think there is a need to show anger. It's something we need to see more of. Um, so, so certainly that 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 is resonating there. But Brida, you spent a cert did you spend a decade abroad? Yeah, I did. yes, that's right. I would have um, moved over there. Uh, well, I, I I started working there, I suppose, during my, my summer holidays while I was a student in the Crawford uh, back um, in the late 80s, early 90s. Certainly, I was uh, working there that summer when I participated in my first Pride. Sorry, um, where? 
Oh, oh if this was in London, my first property. UK, okay. UK, okay. absolutely. Right. That. And and then it, my good friend who was uh, was um, working there that summer, and he was involved with the Lighthouse. For any of you who don't know the Lighthouse, it was a very particular um, in organization in, in London and very much dealing with kind of palliative and end of life care for, um, uh, mm -hmm. for people with AIDS, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it was a very kind of profound, I suppose I would have, in terms of my own political activism, I would have very much seen the 1980s in relation to Anne Lovett and the Kerry Babies, and likewise my time spent in London and kind of seeing firsthand, you know, um, uh, persons, you know, affected communities affected in relation yeah. to AIDS. And certainly yeah. for me, AIDS was a really important watershed moment from the point of view of people talking about sex, especially in yes. Ireland. You yes. know, and I really blew the cover off of things, you know, in a very kind of proactive way, um, but also you know, the, the, the profundity with which the queer body was so kind of abused by society at that time as well, that kind of necropolitics, the allowance that you're, it's only the gays, so it doesn't matter yes. if a couple of them die, you know what I mean? Yes, of course. And, and, and again, that's why it's unfortunate when I was hearing some of those similar kind of tones of necropolitics in relation to COVID as well, um, in terms of being perfectly legitimate for certain individuals to die in a sense. So, you know. so I want to kind of raise the point that really Stephen and even Connor are really kind of a, a, a different generation almost coming of age in the age of prep, um, when we're almost we're almost approaching a post-AIDS uh, context. Now, if you are rich and white and Western, of course, so let's just name that intersection right there. But Stephen and Connor, I mean, do, do you, would you say that you still feel a pressure, the pressure to emigrate, the pressure to, 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 to leave Ireland? Do you think that's still there for men of your generation? Um. Sorry, do you want to go first? Kind of? no, go for it, go for it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think there is, you know, um, um, that sense to, to emigrate and leave because, you know, many of us, um, you know, either you kind of flock to Cork, Dublin kind of areas and, you know, find your communities there. But even then it's quite small and quite restricted. So, you know, I, my my cousin, who's also gay, kind of went over to um, went over to London when he was just finished college and he's only 10, 12 years older than me. And it's kind of like, you know, he saw it as, um, you know, the only way to kind of live openly and kind of honestly was to do that. And I think it's quite, you know, um, it's quite upsetting that we still kind of feel we have to do that um to to just live um the way we'd like um you know i think um i think with us I, I, you know not speaking for anyone else but i think we're i'm getting a sense that ireland is attempting to kind of you know transition into a kind of more liberal space and i'm hopeful i think that it will go that way and I'd rather not you know kind of abandon everything I've grown up with yes. to kind of start over and mm -hmm. if there is the possibility of that then you know maybe it's time to kind of you know make roots and make sure that the next generation wouldn't even have to think about that. Um, I think you, you touched on something important. They used the word liberal. I've, I, I have a, a new thing that we need to use the word compassionate um, because liberal has been weaponized by particularly the American uh, right when they talk about libtards and so on. Uh, so I think it's important that we think in terms of what it is we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is be kind. Uh, thinking about another American chat show host who <laughs> we won't name names. Um, so, so this notion of trying to be part of a more compassionate society and more open to, to others. So Connor, um, what would you describe your experience or your thoughts on that? I definitely didn't feel the impetus to leave because I was gay, but I have to be honest, I left and moved to Brighton after college. So that was like the nearest gay Mecca that I could find to, to go to, but it wasn't for that purpose, if you know what I mean. But I don't, I think me and Stephen, I think we're probably um, <clears throat> a good bit different in age to be fair, but I like, it's interesting that you're younger than me, but I didn't have the same experience. Like I went to a boys school and all of those kind of things, uh, but I didn't have the same experience. I felt like as if I felt really positive about being gay when I was a teenager and well also now 
but uh, I think that's interesting. It's, it's interesting that we're quite close in age, but we had quite different experiences. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, I don't know where that, could, where that came from that I didn't feel that uh, sense of, um, I didn't have a fear growing up no. uh, about coming out or anything. So that's interesting. And, and this question of, of prep. Well, that's uh, interesting. So on. And uh, what would you what would you both think about that? Because certainly Austin and myself would have grown up in the the total. I mean, Brida talks about necropolitics, but um, Leo Bersani wrote an article in the mid 80s called Is the Rectum a Grave? Because uh, sex would kill you. Um, and, and that we were terrorized uh, in the in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but this is not. This wasn't your experience. And well, so the that, landscape has different. Yeah, the landscape has definitely changed in terms of. I mean, it's not even necessarily something that I would have thought about because you know. Um, and as well, I think w- people got complacent as well. I'm not necessarily sure that um, uh, condom use or whatever in in men is that high in in a lot of situations. So I think there was a period in the 90s when we got very complacent about. Uh, um, HIV and AIDS, but now I think because of things like PrEP, it changed the way that we can interact with one another at that mm-hmm. level. Yeah, mm-hmm. There's much more of an openness. Austin, yeah. do you want to remind us of the dark days? Yeah, um, well I was 13 in 1986, and I think that's around the time that the AIDS crisis really hit, kind of in tandem with my sexual awakening, if you will, you know, um, I was 13, I was starting to kind of have these urges and these feelings and then, you know, quite powerful as well. And then the AIDS crisis hit. So yeah, it was fucking terrifying is all I can say. Um, Cause you're trying to grow as an individual, you know, you're in your teenagers, which are kind of tumultuous anyway, you're developing, you're starting to realize your sexuality, you're starting your identity, starting to shine through. And then, yeah, you had this AIDS crisis. Yeah, and I, I, it absolutely terrified me. And then kind of compounding that was the Catholic Church preaching from the pulpit. Um, yeah, like, and yeah, traumatizing. I can, you know, I can safely say it was absolutely traumatizing. And, sec- and um, homosexuality was still criminalized up until whatever it was, 1993. 1993. Yeah, so, yeah, it was a very oppressive time. Like, I lived in Dublin, and I lived in a quite a liberal household. Um, But, yeah, I still felt it. We weren't really a church-going family as such, but it was all over the media. It was all over the newspapers. It was all over the television. It was just a, uh, you know, a hotbed of craziness, really. Um, Yeah, and very damaging, actually. Um, Yeah, and... I actually left Ireland then and went to, you know, and I was quite in the closet for a lot of time. A few close friends as a teenager knew I was gay and they were gay. And I found a small tribe, which was really nice and great. But um, just the wider society of my kind of wider family and friends maybe not didn't really know. So, yeah, you were living this double life. And Stephen touched on it earlier on where, you know, you weren't really progressing as a person and, you know, your kind of development happened 10, 20 years afterwards, which Stephen said, and I think that's spot on. Um, (laughs) But I left when I was 19 and went to study uh, for my degree in Nottingham. And that was just really liberating. No one knew me. I could be myself. I could be anonymous. I could kind of flourish and grow. And it was quite, you know, that was really good for me. Um, and I came back kind of stronger, I think, as well, because of that. I want to t- kind of, uh, we're, we'll wrap up now because we're, we're starting to go over time. But um, again, it, it, one of the surprising things that we might not have considered in terms of the two referenda uh, and, and a bridge to them was the fact that the, um, uh, the fact that contraception was illegal in Ireland uh, up until the mid 80s. Um, meant that uh, for a period of about six years when we were aware of how to prevent HIV through condom use, condoms were illegal in this country because they were a contraceptive. And uh, the Virgin Megastore was selling them and was getting sued something like £5,000 a day uh, for that. 
And it's just in terms of, uh, it's, it's almost mind blowing now to think that the government could have been so unbelievably harmful um, on the bodies of, of all men and women in this country. Um, and so I guess in terms of that, that wrap up of political activism, it is so important to continually call these issues out um, and really to be quite assertive. Brida, you've got your hand up. Yeah, only because I'm just still remembering how the head of the art school who in the Crawford at the time was refusing to allow the condom machine in the actual toilets because he was afraid that somebody would come in from the public and object to it and maybe sue the college. And as I said, uh, you know, that was back in, uh, you know, uh, 1990, 1991, you know, I mean, as I said, it, it's, 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 it's really important to have these conversations and to keep airing these, these things because the present isn't that different from the past. You know, no. and the thing is, is I want a different future, you know, mm -hmm. but for me, I do feel that I'm, I am going through this kind of Groundhog Day scenario every now and again, in a sense. You know? Thank you. So, Carmel, I might hand back to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just have one question, if I may. And I just wonder from from listening to all of you. Do you feel that institutions in terms of schools, third level colleges, galleries, libraries, um, any institutions that are supposed to support, nurture, educate, um, I suppose, have open door, welcome. Are we doing enough? I don't think we are. And if not, you know, what would you like to see? Now, I know we could talk about this for the next hour, but if, if each of you could just say one very brief thing, um, bearing that in mind. I'd really appreciate it because like that too, you know, we're always trying to, to look and listen and learn and develop and connect and support. And I think that the common theme that has come through all our audience uh, throughout the run of this show is, you know, uh, respect and respect for an individual. And also, I mean, the, the feedback on the actual work has been incredible. But over to you. I see Brida has her hand Brida up. Brida has her hand up. I, I'll only put it up this once as well, and I'll keep it very short. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the only way we can really have diversity going on in institutions is if we remove the church from the institutions themselves. And, that's that, and that would so help on, on so many different levels. You know, I, I, I was shocked shook even when I came back from England and started working in the art school in Limerick and um, on, on that Wednesday a couple of students walked past me with the ashes on their head and I realized there was a priest standing on the corridor giving out ashes in the art school and I was like what is going on here are we going back in time or something you know certainly the Crawford was not like that when I was a student there that's all I can say. Okay. Thanks for either. Yeah. Austin, Austin has his hand up. No I totally second that uh, Breda and you know, I think it's absolutely mind blowing to to think that children to get into certain schools have to be baptized still and still in schools. We have communions and confirmations. And the reality is, and I know this from family and friends who have children, they don't believe in the sacraments at all. But yes, we have little girls going down the aisle in little wedding dresses. And I, it's, I find it unsettling and I find it kind of mad that it's still happening to such <laughs> a massive degree, you know. Absolutely. And I would love to see the separation of church from school. And yes, maybe there should be some and people have religious freedom, but it's it's way too much. You know, it's, it's, it's the majority and people don't really have a choice. I mean, their nearest yeah. school may be two miles away from them and out of handiness, they got their child christened, you know. I'll stick in my, my two cents, which is that every publicly funded organization should have a gender neutral bathroom. Yes. Um, Stephen or Connor, do you wanna give the last word? Yeah, I suppose I'd just like to um, point out that like, um, especially for, um, gender non-conforming and, and trans youth, you know, the, the education system is still um, an absolute minefield and there's, you know, the, the harsh religious kind of connotations within it, the kind of unwillingness to kind of engage um, with them is, um, 
is still very present and I think that it's something that definitely needs to be uh, uprooted um, yesterday rather than considering to talk about it tomorrow. Okay. Connor, last word. Yeah, beyond kind of what I said about the, the GAA earlier, uh, in more sort of reflective of what you were asking, Carmel, you know, about what can sort of maybe cultural institutions do. I think you're on the right uh, track in terms of having queer people or any marginalized group be at the forefront of the conversation. I think that's probably the most important thing to do. And I mean, I guess you've done it. So, you know, <laughs> it's all good. Keep doing it. Yes, that's exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Connor. Um, well, I suppose just to wrap up, everyone, thanks again so much for joining us today. Um, it'll be great to be able to do this more frequently, but um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, but thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your contributions. Thank you to Sean uh, for your time and uh, for chairing today. Aoife, thanks so much for giving that succinct overview of the work on show here um, at Loon Gallery. And just to remind you that this wonderful exhibition is here until the 19th of September. It ain't over yet. We've lots more to promote. Keep pushing it on your social channels and we'll keep pushing behind the scenes. Hold up our very beautiful. Absolutely. Catalog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so well done to all of you. Congratulations. Um, I mean that genuinely. And I'll be in touch. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. We have been recording this, as, as we said, from uh, the get-go and um, our PR uh, copies. So we will publish this recording on our social channels over the course of the next day or so. So anybody who missed it will be able to uh, view it at their own leisure. So thanks so much. Thank and, and just to mention as well that uh, we receive funding from Creative Ireland and Westmeath County Council. So institutions, I suppose, also help with regard to funding outreach and these conversations. And that's also, I think, equally important. So thank you. Great, thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thanks very much. Bye. <laughs>